Maybe someday. Maybe never. Have you ever thought about yourself being different, or the person sitting next to you is unique? Ever since I was a teenager, I know that I am different. My heart might not beat differently, but it certainly sounds differently. An ordinary person's heart beat like this, boop boop, boop boop. But my heart beat like this, boop. I didn't know that until I was a teenager. My doctor told me that you need to go to check it up all the way to the heart specialist. So I went all the way to the heart specialist, and the doctor said, mm, "Your heart is like a drawer that can't close properly. So the blood that wants to go in, they want to come back out. Oh, that's why you have murmur." Really? Yes. In fact, you are a typical case. Something called mitral valve prolapse. You will be a perfect case for my students to study, because we don't have many examples like this. Since then, each time I go to the clinic, there are queue of young men, young women, doctors, who will say to me, "Ma'am, may I?" They just want to come to listen to my heart. I was so special. The doctor looked at me and said, "Okay, your heart is like this. It sounds different, but here and now he looked at my card, and he looked at me and looked at my card. Maybe someday you need to do something about it. But here and now, you just leave, go back, and be a nice person. All right. So I need to do nothing. No medicine." Nothing, no. Okay, one thing: if you go to see a dentist, you will need to take antibiotics, a handful like this. Okay, so take good care of your teeth, and then you'll be all right. All right. So I go take care of my teeth, floss every night, and I can avoid seeing the dentist, and I can avoid taking lots of antibiotics. So I live my life just like that. No need of any special care. So life go on. I go study. I go to work just like anyone, but I avoid certain sports. Well, after all, I'm not a scuba diving or a uh, bungee jumping kind of person, so I have excuses. When people ask me, "Hey, roller coaster?" Oh, no, 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 no. I have a heart problem. My heart is special. Don't bother me. It's just a good excuse, isn't it? Until one day, after a long time, I was called back to the hospital. The doctor looked at me and looked at my card, looked at my card and looked at me. After the checking up, he said, "Sorry, your heart, the gap is gone. It's much bigger now. It's time for you to consider doing a heart surgery." I said, "What? But I've been all right. I'm okay." Well, you don't feel it, but you don't want to be a risk to yourself, right? At that point, I have two children. My son is in kindergarten. My daughter is around two something years old. If you know that I have to take such risk, because normally the doctor will tell you that you can do a heart surgery, you'll be all right afterwards. But these are the risks. That means you might die. You take it or you don't take it. Well, but I don't want to be a risk to my family. I don't want to be a risk to my friends. What if you go out with me and suddenly drop dead in front of you? You'll be panicking, right? So it is a big conflict for me, and I was very worried. Because I want to live my life. This is the picture. This is year 2005. My daughter is that young. My son is that young. That was the time when I was already starting to queue up. I have decided that I'm going to go for it, because I want to carry on living. If you want, ask me what do I want at that point. I just want to live, because I don't want my husband to have to take care of the kids like this. So I queue up, and that one day in quiet, I asked my husband. I was really worried. That was in front, a, a few weeks before I might be called. I said, "Alan, can you take care of the children?" Guess what he said? He said, "Yes." I actually want him to say no. <laughs> Men and women are so different. 
He said, yes, because I don't want you to worry, right? After that, after a long time later. But what I want him to say is, no, you must live. I can't take care of the children. Anyway, if men and women are not different, we won't be here. There won't be a population. So there comes this time. The experience, I tell you, was not very nice. I will have to actually put on a rope, only a rope, tie as many bows behind me. And then I was actually pushed into the operation theater in a very cold metal tray. I guess it is easier to clean up afterwards, right? And then my husband was the only person who accompanied me to go to the theater. And I asked him again, you'll be able to take care of the children, right? He said, just come out safe. I was in tears and all that. And then he even have a tissue paper in with me. I said, you take care of it? I said, no, don't worry. They can take care of all these things, okay. The next moment, I was knocked up. Drugs. 21 hours of open heart surgery. My heart stopped beating. I was put to a situation like this that I have to have a machine to help my heart beat. Luckily, after 21 hours, I came out with people calling my name. The three most important men in my life just stood in front of me and started calling my name, and I wake up. The first person, my father, he gave me life, called my Chinese name. The second person, my husband, who I have to share my life with him. And the third person is the person who just cut me up, killed me, and then put me back together, my surgeon. I'm so grateful that I can stand here today because it was not nice to be in a intensive care for so long. But thanks to wonderful of technology nowadays, a lot of things is possible. A lot of illness can be treated, and I thank the medical profession for taking care of people like this. To have this near-death experience, I should have learned something, right? I feel that I have some clarity that I am just flesh and blood. Although I have my work to do, I have things to do, but after all, I'm flesh and blood. And to be able to live again is great. And maybe someday, maybe there's no someday. All we have is just today. So if you consider that the topic is interesting, maybe someday I'll be this, I'll be a superstar, I'll be on TEDx, no, that is just today because life is unpredictable. Here and now, who is the most important person to me? You, you are the most important person to me. That's why I can concentrate. Here is the most important time. I actually am a teacher and I'm very privileged to be able to work with young people and I like that because it makes me feel young. One day, I asked my students, I asked them, now you are in university, what are the five things you want to do that you think you must do in university before you graduate? So they start having activities, and then I go and listen. Guess what? One young man said, oh, there are some very cool video online, and there's a rapper, he, he was smoking grass, and then, and then it was really viral, a few million, 10 million, and 1,000 million of people watching them. I really want to try, try smoking grass and be that cool. I tell you what, I had drugs. In fact, in this moment, the moment I saw the three men, I feel the pain, and I just said, it's very painful. Guess what the surgeon did? Painful? No problem. He pressed more morphine for me. I spent the next two days feeling sick. I threw up everything, all kinds of color. In a serious medical profession, a withdrawal of drug can already cause me such pain and awful experience. If young people like you who are so curious about drug and want to try it, you don't want that because you don't know the purity of that thing and who is behind those things. So you can be curious about life, but don't try drug. Just say no. Life is too valuable for you to risk. Okay, but 
once you are okay again, life goes on and you can easily forget your life experience and even any learning. So get on getting busy and all that. And in life, life is for living and living is full of problems and conflicts. I even have quarrels and arguments with people around me, even my husband. And then there comes a time when I feel that I want to look into conflicts. And I got a chance to study mediation. I would say that mediation is something worth studying. It's one of the best things I ever learned, and I highly recommend you to go for it. Just to at least sit in and listen, up about, listen, it, listen to it, and then experience some activities. Why is mediation so important? Because it helps people look into the problems and try to help them bring back their sense and then talk. All right, I'm not going to talk about what mediation is. You can look, go to Google and, or even come to my class. But then I want to share with you something that everyone can learn. In situations like this, when things are all tangled, we need to be very mindful about how to untangle and not to do certain things that might make things worse. That's what we need to be careful about. And today I'm going to share with you a model that is quite famous. Maybe not everyone has learned, but I find it easy to understand. That is the Thomas Cumin Conflict Handling Model. There are five modes that we can, anyone at any time, can actually think about that we are using. The first one is called avoiding. That is like what? Leave the room whenever there's an argument that you are involved in. Walk out, it's not your problem anymore. You have uh, tangled, tangled growths, even cut it off. In fact, Alexander the Great was facing a Gordian knot. No one can untie it, but he comes, he takes out his sword and just cut it into half. If that is the relationship you think that you don't want to keep, okay, cut it into half and you solve the problem. Walk out the room, avoid it. But in this case, you can just buy time. The problem is not solved, right? Because if you don't want to get involved with that, your friend become a high and buy person. Have you got a high and buy friend? Yeah, it works because it's painful to get along with those people that you don't want to see again. And then, but you are stuck with them, so less conversation, high and buy. Play with someone else. The second kind is called accommodating. That is like, you are my customer, I serve you, you are always right. In workplace, sometimes it's like this. I do projects and I, sometimes I have to remind, remind, remind myself that she is my client. No matter how, I'm service, servicing her. Okay, no wonder I don't want to get into the argument, but I do not care about myself. I only care about the person. It works sometimes, but I am not being nice to myself. The third kind is called competing. Competing comes in many forms. Competing can be like, I am louder, I'm better, I'm more powerful. Competing can be like blaming. Competing can be like finger pointing. In fact, I do this in the class. I ask students to come out and try finger pointing. Yeah, sometimes you want to compete. Young people like you, one thing that they want to do in, during university is to get a date. If both of you fancy the same girl or the both of you fancy the same boy, the best way is to compete. Whoever to win the heart will win, right? So it's a win and lose situation. But when it talk about love, it's not all reasonable, okay? Just be, remind, be reminded. The fourth kind is compromising. Compromising is like no one gets everything. Everyone just gets a bit, okay? You can say that it's a um, lose-lose situation, but sometimes it works, right? Have you ever tried compromising with someone because that will solve the problem? In mediation, sometimes it's like that because it has been prolonged for a long time and people just want to solve the problem and get on with their life. And then they will accept a deal, okay? Compromising is like making a deal. It's work for you, that is great but then you won't be totally happy. And the last kind is called collaborating. Collaborating takes communication 
and you will need to learn how to communicate. Nowadays, we don't communicate that well. We use our phone all the time, right? The person sitting next to us and we communicate via chat chat. And sometimes you don't even chat with one person. You're communicating in a group. Okay, I'm not just talking to you, I'm telling everyone that I'm talking to you. In mediation, I learned something that is great. There is something called caucus. Sometimes communication is, doesn't work well in a group because you are not really communicating. We are showing off that I'm arguing with you, I'm disagreeing with you. A real communication is like caucus, we call it, one-on-one. -on -one. Spend time, talk to each other, Maybe no face-to-face -face is okay, why a phone is okay, but one-on-one -on -one talk about it, work things out. And we also need to learn to use kind words because, well, we are all emotional. People are tied up with emotion. If we do not use kind words, people are thinking that you are trying to uh, outwin me, outsmart me. In fact, you're not really respecting me. It won't work. Okay, communication is a new subject. But then if it works, then it will be a win-win situation and we can make things better. So I want us to be mindful about how we have been handling conflicts because conflicts can be um, triggered by many things. If you ask you to close your eyes for a moment to think about what is the conflict that is bothering you here now? Just think about it for a moment. And then what have you been using? Have you been avoiding? Have you been compromising? Have you been competing, maybe even with your siblings? Or have you been spending time to try to work it out because the, that relationship is important to you? to be mindful about how we communicate and what is the most important thing in our life is very important. In mediation, we learn about common ground. What is common ground? That is the thing that party A and party B both value. Simple as leakage, okay? In Hong Kong, rainy day, it leaks, rainwater. From my floor, it leaks to down to yours. I live in the next floor near to the penthouse. So I don't live in the penthouse. I live next to it, underneath it. So I always have this rain problem that sip into my flat. But the common ground between me and that person is not just the ceiling. It's that we both live in the same building. Will I want to move out because of that? Because I don't want to see that person again? No, we have a common ground, so we have to talk it out, solve it. Who pays? He, she pays, I pay, because the problem can recur. That's the common ground. But in a teamwork, in a workplace, not just common ground. Sometimes we talk about common goals, right? Yeah, we are talking about young people, even start up, yeah. People want to do the business, but then they might have lots of disagreement. We are not afraid of disagreement because disagreement sometimes is good. We get to know each other more about their point of view. And if we do not argue, I mean, in a tactful way, if we do not disagree in a friendly way, then we have no new ideas. We will not have advancement. So do not be afraid of disagreement. It's just that we need to learn how to deal with it. Come and go. The next thing is reality. There is something called a grow model, G-R-O-W. The first one is common goal. Where do you want to go? We want to have this startup business, we want to do that. The reality is what? The R stands for reality. The reality is we have difficulty, we have disagreement, and we have short of resources and all that. Face the reality. In mediation, we also do that. We ask questions, party A, what is the real situation? What do you care about? And then. What is your difficulty, all right? After we've really faced the reality, we can think of options. Options, the sky is the limit. There are many things that is possible. And to be able to do that, we need to think about reality, all right? And then the option is be, to be creative. Sometimes 
The option can be saying sorry. In conflicts, if we do not say sorry, if we do not um, apologize, then people do not think that you respect them. So options. The other thing is you and I. You and I. I want to know that, have you ever seen, heard people or talk to people like that? You and you and you. If the statement starts with you, normally it's like this. You are defensive. You mean you are defensive? You are unreasonable. You, did, you said you will come back for dinner, and I waited for so many t hours, and you have not come back. You said this and you said that. Each time we have a you statement, it's a blaming situation. And this is why we need to learn an I statement. Learn to, learn to feel how we feel. Emotion is to serve us. Sometimes, I, will, I discover that people are not so sure about whether they are angry or they are afraid. If we do not distinguish that our emotion clearly, we can get ourselves into very big trouble. So to learn about how to distinguish our emotion and feel, for example, in a situation of argument, I feel confused and I feel upset when we, each time we have to argue. To learn about these skills, little things as such, just learn a bit of this, then we can solve conflicts. So I statement work. What else can we work? We react much faster than we can think. All right, sometimes we need to count to 10. The moment we want to react and argue back because we are very good, fast thinking, we pause, maybe count to three, take a deep breath because it might help us. Sometimes when you blow it out, blow out of troubles, then you can feel much better. And then share it, find a friend. We have a saying in English, a troubled shared is a troubled half. All these can help us because in daily life, it's not about now. We have a saying that everything is going to be all right at the end. Have confidence. If it is not okay now, it's not the end. We can still work on it. We can still communicate and do something about it. And it's not just one way. There are many ways of doing it. Like the students um, who, are, who is interested in are curious about drugs, I would say that he needs to use the way of competing. It's not about avoiding. Why? Because he, he needs to put all the resources to actually conquer the interest of wanting to try drugs. Get all the help you can get. And it's not about win and lose. It's not about being a winner, because if I win, someone lose, right? Do you know that in chess, playing chess, what is the most difficult way of playing chess? If you are playing with your boss, or an emperor, or the premier, you can't win. Because how can you outsmart your emperor? And you can't lose. You are so dumb. I can defeat you. The most difficult game to play is to play a draw. That means you don't win and you don't lose. That is to strike the balance that I am not dumb and I do not let you beat me. Thank you very much. <laughs>